Good morning. It's good to see you all on this nice sunny morning. Oh, wait, that's next week's script. This nice rainy Monday, uh, Sunday morning. It's good to see we all uh, got out despite the, uh, the cold and the rain. And uh, those of us that were at the Barnstormers yesterday got a nice taste of the, the cold and rain ahead of time. And we had a lot of fun. And uh, Caleb called a home run ball out in the tent. So that was, that was exciting. So. I do want to give a special welcome to all of you that are here for the first time. Uh, if you're here for the first time or maybe one of the first few times, if you haven't yet gotten a, a purple welcome bag in the back, I would encourage you to pick one of those up on your way out. Uh, we've got a special gift in there for you, some information about the church, and there's a connect card in there we would love for you to fill out so that we could just connect with you, give you some more information, answer any questions you have about the church and that sort of thing. I promise we're not going to use it to harass you or anything like that. Uh, just some other announcements this morning. There is a child dedication coming up next week, May 12th. Uh, if you're interested, please let Pastor Vaughn know. Uh, and for those of you that already have talked to him, if you have your form uh, for that, if you haven't turned that in, please turn that in to him by Wednesday of this week. Uh, also coming up next week is the CPR class that Jeannie Carlisle is putting on. If you have not signed up for that yet and are interested, please do so. Uh, so there's limited spots so we can make sure uh, we have planned accordingly. It's being offered on May 14th or the 16th. You only have to attend one. It's from 5.30 to 9 o'clock each night. If you have any questions, you can contact Jeannie. And our Ladies Garden Tea Party is coming up on Saturday, May 18th from 11 to 1. That'll be here at the church. Uh, Julia DeBerry will be our guest speaker. Tickets are $10, and they will be on sale in the lobby after the service. And uh, if you or a member of your family is graduating this year from either high school, college, trade school, whatever, uh, please let us know. Uh, we will be celebrating all of our graduates on June 2nd, uh, and so we need to know in advance who we're celebrating uh, so that we can plan accordingly for that. So please email Natalie in the church office if you have a graduate in your family. And then uh, an update for the bulletin. The bulletin, I believe, says COGS is this week. It is not. It is moved to the 23rd. Uh, so that's a, it's a incorrect in the bulletin. So COGS will meet on May 23rd this month. All right. And that is it for the announcement. So let's open up our service with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to gather and worship you this morning, Lord. Lord, we, we pray for this rain, uh, even though sometimes we it can be feel like a bit of a downer and puts us in a bad mood if we have to walk out and get our hair wet or something like that. Lord, Lord, we know this is a, uh, a vital part of, uh, of this world that you have created, Lord. It's through this rain that we get the beautiful flowers, uh, the crops grow, uh, the nice green grass, all of that. So, Lord, we thank you for the refreshing rain uh, and the, the life that it provides. Uh, Lord, I pray that this service will provide life to all of us uh, through the worshiping you through music, worshiping you through our offerings, and then worshiping you through studying the word through Pastor Dick's message. Uh, be with Pastor Dick as he delivers the word, and I just pray that all of us will have open hearts and minds uh, to the message that Dick is delivering this morning, and we trust that it is your word that he is delivering uh, and that there's something in it for all of us. So I just pray that we uh, can find what it is you are trying to tell us this morning through your message pray all this in your name. Amen. So this week on Wednesday night, we closed our Awana program for the year, and you may have seen some of the decorations still outside, uh, out there in the lobby. Uh, we, we turned it into a, a very formal black tie event, so uh, given my reputation and it being Cinco de Mayo, some of you may have been expecting me to have a, a shirt with tacos on or something like that. Uh, I actually meant to and forgot to order one. So the other thing, the uh, reason why I didn't is because uh, we wanted to showcase Awana this morning and celebrate uh, what we accomplished this uh, school year through the kids. Uh, two years ago when this church started the Awana program, they were averaging around 20 kids. Last year they averaged around 30, and this year we were hovering around 40. Uh, and in fact, we had 42 or 43 kids at the closing program on Wednesday. Uh, so that was a, a big celebration, and we wanted to, to celebrate Awana a little bit. Uh, Lanty, come on up. 
Uh, Lanty is the local Iwana missionary. Uh, we support him, uh, not just through doing the Iwana program, but we also provide some support to him as well. He was our missionary of the month last month, uh, but we're going to have him up here today to just talk about what's uh, going on with Iwana and what he's up to. So, Lanty, here you go. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, you guys got started in Iwana two years ago, and you, got, you joined something pretty big. I don't know if you know that. Uh, we're in 136 countries around the world. Uh, now, I just want to let you know about what we're doing, but I want to tell you about something that God is doing. Uh, in the continent of Africa, I don't know if you guys know this, a few years ago, uh, um, it's, it's, they brought Iwana clubs into a school because they looked out at their, at their group and said, hey, we love Awana. We want to bring it in. And they brought it into their school. They brought it into their school, and the school kind of changed a little bit. The kids, kids started coming more often. They were more, more respectful, uh, and things were changing so much that they invited the administrator of education of the whole country to come and see what they were doing in their schools. And you know what happened? The school administrator of that country said, we love this. We want to do this in the whole country of Zimbabwe. So the whole country of Zimbabwe put it in their school system, and you know what happened since then? We have 15 countries in the country in the in the continent of Africa who are using Awana in their school systems today. We have over eight. We have over a, yeah. Give God the glory for that. I tell you, we have over a, a million kids that are under the gospel because you know what? Anybody here ever hear Paul Harvey? Anybody here listen to Paul Harvey? What did he always say? He always say, "Here's the rest of the story." So let me tell you the rest of the story. You know how it got really got started? There were two teachers in that school who watched their community. There were, there were Muslim schools starting in their community, and they were worried, hey, what are we going to do to reach our kids with the gospel? So they started with the Iwana ministry, said if we could bring that in, it would change. And you know what? That's what it did. Two people decided we're going to do something, and now a whole country started using it in their schools, and now 15 countries are using it in their schools. That's an amazing thing. That's not something Awana ever said, hey, we're going to go out and go into a school system. We didn't decide that at all. God said, I'm going to do this because a couple people said we got to reach the next generation with the gospel. So I want to just tell you that. That's what's happening around the world, and it's, I can tell you that all kinds of things. We're in countries we're not allowed to even talk about because... You know, it's just restricted. You can't do those kind of things. But you guys are involved in something great, and we are too. We are here in locally here in, in South Central Pennsylvania, and we have been added uh, in January. We added the state of Delaware to us. So we're able to go over there and try to reach more kids with the gospel. So anybody ever been to Delaware before? Okay, so I've always been to Delaware. I always go down the main, you know, go down 1 or 13. You know, there's, 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 there's stuff on the western side of that, and there's stuff on the eastern side of that, okay? I didn't know that before, because I never went anywhere. I went on and went down to the beach or wherever. So now I get to travel to some of those other places and found, hey, there's, there's people on the western side of that. There's people on the eastern side of that. So just pray for us there that we can go out and reach some more churches. We only have like 16 churches now in the whole, in the whole state that is using Awana. We'd love to see more of that, because we want to reach the next generation with the gospel. So thank you guys for doing Awana. And what you just said, your, your numbers have gone up. We've heard that across the board this year in our Awana clubs. More of them are telling us more kids are coming to their Awana club. Then the exciting part is more kids are getting saved through their Awana club. There's more kids that are memorizing scripture through their Awana club. So we want to thank you for being a part of that. Uh, you're part of something big, even bigger than we could ever imagine. But again, it all started in, in Africa. It started with a couple people. And they did the same thing here with a couple people who said, we want to do this here. So never think you're, just, you're part of something small. You're part of something big. When we get to heaven, we don't know what kind of impact we're going to have. You know, some kid might, somebody might come and say, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for what you did in trying to reach me with the gospel in Mount Joy, Pennsylvania. All right, so thank you for that. Pray for us as we travel. I always tell the little kids as we go to visit churches, pray for me as I travel because I don't want those little four-legged deer jumping out in front of me. I want to get to where I need to go and get back, uh, but we want to keep continue to share the gospel. Anybody believe the Lord's coming back soon? Yeah, we don't have a lot of time, right? So we got to get out there and get it done. So just pray for us as we do that, and we want to thank you for doing Awana here and continue the good work. If you're not volunteered in Awana, I always tell people, 
Doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. If you're, if you're a, a, uh, a grandparent and you have grandkids that come in and you love on them and you send them home, you know what? That's a wanna. That's what we do. We invite kids in, we love on them, we share the gospel with them, and we send them home. If you know how to be a grandparent, guess what? You know how to be an Awana person. Right? You can be one. You've already, you've, already, you've already got trained. That's what we do. All right. So thank you for letting me come and share a little bit with you. Just, again, pray for us because what's happening in Africa is awesome. But you know what? The devil doesn't like that. He's going to try to fight us. He's going to try to stop us. So pray that that doesn't happen, that we continue to have that good open door because it might not last long. We don't know what will happen. So thank you again. Let's stand up and begin our worship. Oh, there is more. Okay, sorry. We, we want to recognize our Awana workers. We have a gift for them. So we're going to ask all of our Awana workers to come up front. If you've worked in Awana this year, we're going to ask you to make your way up front here. And uh, we're going to let you tell your name and how many years you've been in Awana. So come on up front. Just line up across the front. And I'm going to pass the mic right down here in a minute. So we're going to start here at this end and uh, tell us what club you work in and how many years you've worked in Awana. So I am TJ McNeese. I've been doing Awana since we started for three years. Uh, I'm the commander, which means I pretty much deal with or not deal with, I get to be with all of the children. I do, I do cubbies every other week, which is the three and four year olds. I do the opening every night for all of the children. And then I fill in whenever anybody else can't make it and help uh, memory verse with those children. I'm Allison Wagner. Um, I help with TNT. This is my second year doing Awana and I check the kids in and help with games and all that fun stuff. Hi, I'm Dave Lloyd. I'm the game leader. That means I'm the fun guy. Not the mushroom, the fun guy. <laughs> I'm Amanda Mutterspall, and I'm one of the Cubbies teachers. I'm Nikki McNeese, and I've been with it since it started three years. And I'm one of those grandmothers, you know. I love, I came because I wanted to be with my grandchildren, but I got a whole lot more grandchildren, you know. They're all, I consider them all my grandchildren, so. I'm Gary McNeese. Uh, been with Juana for three years, and I'm the teacher for the TNT. Uh, Larry Crable, been with Juana for two years, uh, TNT teacher and part-time game director. <laughs> Sherry Valley, Sparks leader, been with it for three years. Charlotte White, first year of Sparks leader, and I enjoy doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Melissa Carmen. I've been in um, Awana for six years. Um, I am a TNT director, or not director, I'm sorry, TNT leader, and I take lead in the store. Hi, I'm Sabrina Hackney. Last year I was a Sparks leader, and this year at the end of, or no, last year, at the end of last year, I went up part-time to help with Cubbies. All right, so I just, want to say thank you to all of you volunteers. Uh, you guys should really see they are a well-functioning machine. Uh, Dick and I basically float, so if somebody isn't able to make it there, we step in, but these guys do a great job. I think they could do it without us, just as good as with us there. So thank you all so much, and I know you guys, some of you love being up here in front of everybody, so we won't keep you up here any longer. But. <laughs> Awana is based on four colors, red, blue, green, and what? Yellow. yellow. So that's why red, blue, green, and yellow. <laughs> and I'll tell you what's in there. <clears throat> These leaders are important in helping to preserve the word of God in boys' and girls' lives. That's a hint what your gift is. <laughs> All, right. All right, Bob, now you can go. <laughs> I don't want to do anything. <laughs> hey. All right, let's try standing up and beginning our worship. <laughs> yes, eh? Oh, my God. 
Father, if we could see your face, we pray that as we were singing these songs this morning, that you were smiling upon us, that you were pleased with us, Father. We worshiped you, Holy Spirit, Christ, Holy God, King of kings and Lord of lords. So, Father, these aren't words and just fun songs to sing, but I pray, Father, that these words were expression of our heartfelt love for you and that you truly are King of kings and Lord of lords in our lives. Father, uh, we're so grateful that you have given us so much to offer, whether it's songs of praise through inspiring musicians to write notes and uh, people to write words, or you've given us money or our lives or our gifts and our talents. We, you have given us so much, Father, to offer to you. But this morning, uh, we not only offer up our sacrifices of praise to you and ourselves as living sacrifices, but we also think about the monies that we're giving this morning as we focus on furthering your kingdom here in this world, here in Pennsylvania, uh, here in uh, our local area, and that as our monies goes to reach people in need, that your power and your presence would go with that money and it would bring you honor and glory in all that we do and all that we say. We continue our worship, Father, exalting you and praising you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, Joy Kids, uh, I'm thinking are dismissed.
Excellent job as always, choir. Right, we want to enter into a time of communion. So if anybody did not receive the elements on the way in, put your hand up and we'll get somebody to, to get you the elements to you. We've got a few over here, Mark, thanks. And I'll just remind everybody that we, we practice open communion, which means you don't have to be a member of this church to take part. Uh, we just ask per the biblical guidelines that you be a saved Christian. Other than that, uh, you are welcome to join us in communion. Does anybody else need elements over here, Mark? I want to read a Bible verse before we go to prayer from 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. And John writes here, We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and the Son and His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And that's really what we're, we're celebrating this morning through communion, is the, the fellowship with our Savior that we have, uh, not just here on earth, but will have uh, when we join Him in heaven. So, as we often do, as we are called to in the Bible, we're going to start with a time of prayer and reflection, uh, just to confess anything that we need to confess before we enter into communion. So let's take some time to, for private prayer. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him for his body, the bread of life. Dearly Father, we, we thank you for the sacrifice you made by giving up heaven to come down here on earth, to live as man, to have a body so that you could sacrifice on the cross for us, Lord. And so, Lord, as we, as we take this bread, which is symbolic of your body, Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us. Amen. You may partake of the bread. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So let's pray for Jesus' blood, which represented by the juice. Dear Heavenly Father, this, this cup of juice symbolizes the blood that you sacrificed on that cross, Lord. And Lord, when we, we, we read that the medical descriptions of everything you went through on the cross and how your sweat turned to blood and the sacrifice you made, Lord, it's, it's a painful reminder sometimes of just what you went through and the suffering you went through and the, the blood that you sacrificed for us so that we can have the new covenant with you. So, Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us. pray this in your name. Amen. You may partake of the cup.
I appreciated Adam's prayer at the beginning of the service today because it made me stop and think. I got up this morning and I was down. I felt really down. I don't know if it was the rain or what, but then when Adam prayed and he said, Lord, even when the rain gives us a bad hair day, I knew right away it was the bad hair day that had me down. So thank you, Adam, for clearing that up for me today, what I was struggling with this morning. Well, we've been on a journey in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 on Christ's longest sermon on the Sermon of the Mount, and we will continue this journey right through the summer, uh, right into the month of August, and we'll finish up at the end of August. Uh, Next week... um, Dave Lloyd will be preaching, and I'm excited to hear his message. He'll continue in this uh, series that we're on, and he'll be talking about uh, verse 14 and 15, so it'll be following today's message. And uh, I would be amiss to not tell you that today's message for me is difficult, because I struggle with prayer. You say, Pastor, you're the pastor of the church. There's times I struggle to pray like I should. I really do. And so this message I find hard to preach today because it's an area that I have to continually work on. And... uh, So let's pray, and then we're going to look at the the Scripture this morning. Father in heaven, again, there are times when we come to portions of Scripture in your Word that are difficult. Father, for me, sometimes they're easier to preach than they are to live. And this is one of those texts today, Father, And so, Lord, I I pray that even as I've prepared for this message this week and thought through this message this week and been convicted over and over and over again about sometimes the lack of my own prayer life, and Lord, you know my desire, you know my heart's desire is to spend time in prayer, my heart's desire is to spend time in the Word of God, and yet, Lord, at times I put other things before that. And so, Lord, this morning, help us as we look at this portion of Scripture to be honest with ourselves, to be open with ourselves. And, Lord, as the Holy Spirit convicts us, as the Holy Spirit encourages us today, Father, that we'll find strength to confess sin, that we'll find strength, Father, to... uh, ask you for forgiveness, that we'll find the strength that we need to commit ourselves afresh to a life of prayer. I pray these things in your precious name. Amen. In one region of Africa, the first convent, first converts to Christianity were very diligent about praying. In fact, they had these regular patterns of prayer. And it was interesting that each believer in the villages had a particular place where they would go to pray. And so they would go outside of the village, out into the brush, out into the, the, the uh, woods there, and these would be their prayer rooms. And by using these private prayer rooms all the time, paths would begin to wear. And you could tell where somebody would walk over and over and over again to spend time in prayer with the Lord. Because these new Christians were concerned about each other's walk with God, if they noticed that one of these prayer paths were beginning to grow over, they would simply approach their brother and sister and say this, we notice that your prayer path has grown. 
Friend, the grass on your path has begun to grow. And when I read that illustration earlier this week, I thought about my own prayer path. And how sometimes the grass grows on my prayer path because I don't spend the time that I need to. Dwight Al Moody, one of the greatest evangelists of all times, was crossing the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, the ship that he was on caught fire. And uh, he and a friend that was with him got on the bucket line, and they began to pass the water down the line to, fa- to fight the fire. Moody's friends said, you know what? Maybe we need to go off the line and go to the other end of the ship and simply pray. Dwight Moody, the common sense evangelist, said, no, sir, We'll stand right here and pass the buckets and pray hard all the time we're doing so. When I think of prayer, prayer is important, but action is important also. Adam and I are going through a course together on preaching to try to improve our preaching, and uh, this week in our course that we're taking together, we were talking about this, and this is important. In the course this week, it said this, prepare to preach like everything depends on you, and pray like everything depends on God. Prepare like everything depends on you, but pray like everything depends on God. And so there's a dual thing, even in our art of preaching, where we need to what? We need to prepare. We need to spend time in the Word. We need to spend time praying. We need to spend time studying the Word together, but at the same time, what? We need to pray. We need to pray like, listen, all that doesn't count because what we say really needs to come from God. And we need to depend on God. And so today we look at our text and we'll read our text. I think we can put it up on the screen there. And uh, in John 14, 14, he says, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I will do it. That's a great command or commandment, isn't it? If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Let's go to the next slide. And... uh, I think our text is on there. It says this, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not, like them, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. And here's our pattern of prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So there's our text for today. And let me remind you in the context, again, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is using three illustrations to show how sometimes people practice their Christianity to gain attention to their life. And last week, or two weeks ago, we talked about our giving, that uh, not even our right hand should know what our left hand does. We don't give to, you know, bring attention to ourselves. We give to the needs uh, that God lays on our heart. And then this week, he's going to use the illustration of prayer. And the first thing I want you to notice in the text is this. He says three times, 
when you pray. Look at the text again, if you would. Look at it. Look at verse 5. And when you pray. In verse 6, but when you pray. And then verse 7, and when you pray. So what's Jesus taking for granted here? That you what? That we pray. That we pray. He says it right there in the text three times. When you pray. Let me give you some instructions he says about when you pray. He's going to talk, don't draw attention to yourself. This is between you and the Lord. And he's going to, he's going to give us a pattern of prayer. But so the first thing, when we pray. So he takes for granted that as Christians, we sure, certainly should be talking to God. We should be spending time. And let me give you some reasons real quick of why we should pray. Number one is up there, because there's a devil. There are devil, there's a devil and there are demons that are working all around us and uh, tripping up Christians, trying to keep people from hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we should be praying all the time because there's a devil who is alive and well. And there are demons who are alive and well and going against everything that Christ stands for. Number two, we should pray. Why? Because prayer is God's appointed way of obtaining things. In a marriage relationship, communication is so important. And I can tell you that a lot of couples struggle in their marriage relationships because they don't know how to communicate with each other. And they don't spend that time communicating. Oh, they'll spend a lot of time in front of the television set or at a movie and all those things. But they're not spending face-to-face -face time communicating with each other. And so the relationship breaks down. And it's the same way in our relationship with God. Listen, prayer is the way that we obtain things from God. It's the way that we build a relationship to God. The third thing is this. The disciples regarded prayer as important. When you go back and you study, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, the Jewish custom was to pray a minimum of three times a day. And some of the Jews prayed as much as 18 times a day. They would stop in their schedule and spend time praying no matter what they were doing. And so we see in regards to the work of the Lord, the apostles spent time in prayer. And then number four, Prayer occupied a very prominent place in Christ's life. 38 different times in Christ's th three years of ministry, we see a little bit about his prayer life, 38 different times. We see him praying in the morning. He got up early and went and prayed. We see him praying alone. We see him praying all through the night on several different occasions. We see him praying before a major event happened in his life. I think Christ's pattern of prayer life is a good example for us. But prayer, if it was important for Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, shouldn't it be important for you and me? Yeah, it should be, shouldn't it? And then number five is simply this. Prayer is a part of the present ministry of Christ. Christ makes intercession even today for you and me. He is our advocate to the Father in heaven. So it continues to be important in his life. And for us, it should be. We should be people of prayer. We should be people of prayer. But here in this portion of Scripture, there is the perversion of prayer. And again, in our text, the perversion is this, is that people are praying instead of to the audience of one, they're praying to the audience of many. They're praying to get attention, 
to themselves. And that's what the text says. And he says, when you stand in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others, truly, I tell you that you've received your reward in full. Other words, listen, when you stand to pray to bring attention to yourself, your prayer motive is wrong. And so even when we stand to pray in public, we need to ask ourselves, is this about people hearing my words? Is this about people being impressed with the way I'm praying? I remember growing up as a kid, we had the King James Bible, and people prayed in King James English. I don't know if any of you else experienced that, but I always thought that was the only way you could pray, with these and thous. That was the proper, but you know, Again, why? Is it to bring attention to us? Why, when we pray in public, we have to stop and think, what is my motive? And I, and I share this with you, and I, I shared it with you before. When we talked about what are our motives, sometimes my motives aren't pure. I've talked about that even in my preaching sometimes. You know, when I get to the back door and you come by and you say, boy, that was a great message, Pastor, and I think, it really was. Aren't I just a phenomenal preacher? <laughs> really was. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I struggle with motives. Many of us are reading through a book called Sunday. And uh, today's devotional was phenomenal. It's the 18th week of the year, the 18th Sunday of the year, the 18th devotional. And it was all about our hearts. It was all about how really wicked we are. And, and, I, and I think about that, how sometimes my motives and, 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 may, and probably even in my prayer, and it comes back to this. It's all about look at me. Look at me. Look how great I am. And it's all about pride. And Christ in his Sermon on the Mount is saying here, listen, your pride is getting in the way of your service, of your prayer life. And so he says, listen, don't pray to impress other people. But he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And so we should think about prayer. Even when we're praying in public, we still have an audience of one. And that's God. That's all it that matters when we pray that we're praying. Our true audience ought to always be God. It's not as much about the place. It's not about the attitude. It's really about the audience. Who are we praying to? And then he talks about in the text the content of your prayer. The content of your prayer. He says, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. The interesting thing is God knows our needs before we even come to him. God knows what we're going to pray before we even come to him. We don't need a rosary to pray through over and over again, the same idle thoughts or idle words, some religious ceremony. Jews ended up picking this pattern of prayer up from the Gentiles who prayed for the same thing over and over and over again. It's like when you go to bed at night, do you still pray, now I lay me down to sleep? I would hope not. I would hope you're past that in your prayer life. I hope that it's not the same thing over and over and over again. Remember when your kids were two and three years old and they asked you the same question or the same thing over and over and over again. Did that not drive you crazy? Did that just not make you want to smack them? No, come on. 
<clears throat> the reality is, is I, I think sometimes God must feel like that about us. Now, there are certain things that I think is fine. You know, when you have a lost family member, you have a lost friend who, if they don't come to know Christ as their Savior, will spend eternity separated from God in a Christless place called hell. Listen, I'm going to go to the throne over and over and over and over and begging for that person to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. But again, our true content of our prayer needs to be sincere. Prayer is not for God. He knows, like I said, what we're going to ask before we ask it. Prayer is for us. Prayer is for us. See, prayer is saying, God, listen, I can't live this life on my own. God, I don't got it all together. God, my life is a mess. God, I need your help. And so when I don't pray, what I'm telling God is, God, I got it all together. I really don't need you. And I say that even in my own life, you know. Oh, I got it all together, so that's why I'm not praying, God, because, man, look how good I'm doing. And, and, and here's the thing is, listen, the reason for prayer is for us. And for us to have that connection for God, for us to be able to say, listen, God, I need you. I don't have it all together. I am a mess. I'm a mess, God. You know, and that's the whole thing about this Sermon on the Mount. It is there not to say, wow, look how good I am. It's there to show us what a mess we are. And we can't live this Christian life on our own. I need the Holy Spirit who lives within me to take control and to produce love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness. I can't do it. I make a mess. And so, God, I need you. That's what prayer is all about. And then here in the text, he gives you a pattern. He shows you. Now, I'm not saying this is the only way to pray. I'm not saying if you, if you don't do this, you know, then you're not praying the right way. I remember growing up, and, and I, I forget even what Sunday school class it was in, but some Sunday school teacher stood up and put a glove on her hand. And on that glove was written these words. Anybody remember the prayer glove? So, your little finger, your little finger was meant um, confession, because you always start off with confession, is what I was told. This finger represented petition, petitioning God for things. This finger represented uh, intercession, that I'm praying for other people. Uh, this finger meant thanksgiving, and then your thumb meant praise. And that was, I remember that from a child being taught how to pray. You can still buy that prayer glove today. If you go to Christian Books, you can, you'll find that prayer glove. you seen that, Lanty? Yeah, you can get it. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to teach kids how to pray. Here's a pattern that Christ lays down for us that I think is good for us to think about as adults. And so when we think about the pattern of prayer, prayer starts by focusing on God. Our Father in heaven hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. And so when I come to God, you know, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to come recognizing what a great God he is. I remember, you know, before I had a paper route and before I had my own money, and when, when I wanted money, I would go to my dad and I would say, hey, dad, man, you are such a great dad. <laughs> You're the best. There's nobody as good as you, dad. Hey, do you have a dollar? <laughs> yeah, we all, we've all been there. We all remember that. And so God, this is God. We're coming into the creator of the universe, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so we come in, you know, hallowed, praising him, adoration. We know in the book of Proverbs it says that God dwells in the midst of praise. God loves it when his people praise him. 
And praise is important. Praise is me telling God who he is, how great he is. God, I want to praise you for your love, for your mercy. God, I want to praise you for your forgiveness. God, I want to praise you for <coughs> your omniscience, your power. I want to praise you, God, for all of these things. And so it's good to start off praising God for who he is. Because God loves when his people praise him. The Bible says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Praise is the avenue that leads to the street where God's throne is. Praise. It's, and that's how this prayer starts. Our Father in heaven, holy be thy name. Secondly, Prayer must include God to rule and reign in your life. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done, just like it is in heaven. The question is this, is God's will carried out in your life? The aspect in prayer is putting Christ in proper place in our lives. We're asking him to rule and reign in our lives because, again, Listen, here's the thing about living the Christian life. I find in one second, God is ruling and reigning in my life, and in the very next second, Dick Vaughn is ruling and reigning. How quick that happens. Man, I'm walking in the Holy Spirit, things are going great, and all of a sudden, something happens, somebody says something, it's a rainy day, my hair is a mess, and I am down. And the flesh is in control. And so that's why it's important. God, your will be done in my life. God, allow Dick Vaughn to die to self and allow the Holy Spirit to live through me. I, I pray that prayer a hundred times a day. Because I am so quick to put self back in the driver's seat of my life instead of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm always praying, God, help Dick Vaughn to be dead. God, allow the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity, to work through me, to live through me, to produce the fruits of the Spirit. So tomorrow morning, I'm going to knock on your door. And I'm going to be saying, I'm here today to make every decision for you. I'm going to tell you what to eat for breakfast. I'm going to tell you how to drive to work and the route to take. I'm going to tell you what to eat to lunch, for lunch. I'm going to tell you, don't watch that on TV. Watch this on TV. I'm going to tell you every day, I'm going to make every decision for you. What time of the day do you think you'd hit me and throw me out? <laughs> 9 a.m.? <laughs> Maybe even if that. Here's the reality of it. That's really what we're wanting Jesus to do, to make every decision for me. Again, the problem, I don't know if you have it, I have it, is I want to make my own decisions. But that's what we're saying here, Lord, you be in control. And then prayer includes asking God for your needs. God's waiting to provide for you. Over in Matthew chapter 7, he says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Ask. God's waiting. He's waiting to meet your needs. He's got abundance of food, houses, cars, jobs. He has an abundance of everything. But I do want to remind you this morning that God often works in two ways. First of all, he works through our efforts. 
You know, don't, don't tell me, you know, I don't have any food or I don't have this or I don't have that and you're not willing to work. Because God says, listen, you work and then you get. And then he not only works through our work, but he works through sometimes the generosity of others. And I told you two weeks ago, church, you guys are phenomenal in this. You guys are always giving to each other to meet each other's needs. I, I've seen it, it where food is given. I've seen it where cars are given. I've seen it where batteries are given. I've seen it where, you know, houses are given. Money for houses are giving, given. And you guys are phenomenal and being generous to meet each other's needs. And then this one, he says this, prayer includes confession. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us for all unrighteousness. That's why I like that little prayer hand that starts off with confession. Because sometimes I have to, I think, start with confession even before I tell God how great he is. But confession, it's coming to God and saying, God, listen, this is what I've done. I need you to forgive me. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal sin in your life. Confess each sin individually to the Lord. And I just want to stop and say there is sometimes, you know, we get to the end of the day and we think about, oh, I, I need to confess my sin. And man, we have so many sins of omission and commission. There's no way. It, that's about like what I like to do when Virginia goes shopping. And then she brings all the groceries home, seven bags or five bags. And I just pray over all the groceries on the counter. Then I don't have to pray the rest of the week at my meals. <laughs> right? Isn't that better than you know, one big prayer rather than just little individual ones? That's how some of us confess our sin. God, just forgive me for all of it. You know, there's a lot of it, God, so just forgive me. No, listen. I think God wants us, and that's why prayer throughout the day is so important. You know, you know I have a wrong thought, or I have a wrong attitude, or... Somebody says something or I snap, I snap back at Virginia, immediately not only confessing it to her, but confessing it to the Lord. That attitude was wrong, Lord. Please forgive me. Maybe you don't have the struggles like I do, but if I waited to the end of the day, I could be up all night. <laughs> it's the reality of it. Confess. Confess. Our sin, not only to God, but to each other. Hindrance to the forgiveness, it hinders my prayer and it hinders my walk with God. And next week, Dave's going to talk about those two verses. Because the interesting thing is Christ tells me to forgive in the prayer. And then right at the end of the prayer, what does he talk about? Forgiveness. Because I think he knows that we all struggle with that so greatly. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Whoa. The biggest hindrance to prayer often is unforgiveness and bitterness. And then, and then E, prayer also includes asking God for protection. For protection, I need protection. Listen, I think our temptations or our trials often turn into temptations. It would have been easy for Joseph in the Old Testament after his brother sold him into slavery. It would have been easy for him to have bitterness and resentment towards him. But you know the story, when his brother showed up, what did he do? He forgave them. He forgave them for what they had done. See, when you pass up a certain magazine, a book, a movie, a theater, or a certain program on your television, 
That can be a test to show your spiritual strength. If you fail, it will turn into temptation that incites your lust and draws you into sin. If you're fired from a job, that might be a test. How are you going to handle it? If you take it joyously and commit your situation to the Lord, you'll pass the test. But Satan will tell you, you ought to do everything you can to ruin your boss's reputation and badmouth him. Go ahead and complain to God for making things rough on you. While God is allowing a trial, Satan is trying to make it a temptation. God allows trials into our life. Satan turns them into temptation. And so how are we doing with those? We need to pray for God's strength in our everyday trials that they don't turn into temptation that then lead to sin. And then lastly, I think we end it like we started. We end it by praising God. We start and we end with praise. We ask God to rule our life. We ask God to provide. We ask God to forgive. We ask God to protect us. That's the pattern of prayer. Let's bow our heads this morning. What's the first prayer that God hears? Well, doesn't God hear all our prayers? No, because when we're born into this world, we are born sinners separated from God. And the Bible tells us that our father is the father of lies, Satan. But the first prayer that God hears is when you pray and say, Lord, I am a sinner. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I believe that you were buried and you rose again for my sin. And Lord, I am putting my faith and trust in you today to take me to heaven. That's the first prayer, the sinner's prayer that God hears. And, it, and it, it might look different for all of us, but it starts when we realize that we're a sinner. Well, it starts when we admit that we're a sinner. It starts when we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. And then when we confess it and we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we Begin a prayer line to God. And so if you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, if you're not sure you would go to heaven if you died today, maybe right there in the quietness of this moment, you can pray a prayer like that. It's the most important decision you will make in life is where are you going to spend eternity? I'm not asking you this morning if you're Baptist or Catholic or Methodist or Presbyterian or Episcopalian. That does not make one iota of difference in getting you into heaven. I'm not asking you where you're going to church. I'm asking you, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Are you 100% sure you're on your way to heaven? If not, then today you can make that decision. And then to us who already know Jesus as our Savior, do you struggle in your prayer life? Would you be willing to say today, hey, Dick, pray for me. I'm like you. I struggle. I want to, but I don't. I allow other things to get in my way. Dick, some days there, I'm, 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 I'm really good and I spend time praying and talking to God and then there are days I don't even talk to God at all. And would you pray for me? Would you just slip up your hands, slip it back down and say, hey, that's where I am today. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. I appreciate the honesty this morning. Sometimes it's hard to be honest. 
How about it? Father, I thank you for this Sermon on the Mount that really shows us what bad shape we are. It shows us how we need the cross of Jesus Christ every day of our lives. That every day we need to be finding ourselves running to the cross and looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Father, I pray for those, including myself, Lord, who are hot and cold when it comes to this area of prayer, not as effective as I want to be or need to be. Help us to be able to pray like you'd want us to. Lord, I pray for those who might sit here today and they're not sure of an eternal home in heaven. They're not sure if they're even going to heaven. Lord, help them, maybe even after the service today, to seek out Pastor Adam or myself and talk to us how, so we can show them they can know for sure. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Stand up uh, for our final song. Our final song is more than a hymn. It is a prayer. And I want to tell you a little something about this tune before we sing it. Back in 1907, this was contemporary Christian music, okay? It's hard to think about 1907 having contemporary music. But if you do the math, it's 117 years old. And if you think, oh, yeah, I love this song. I've sung it a million times. But I want you to sing it today as though it's the first time you've sung it. Uh, if you listen to all the topics and the parts of Dick's sermon Listen to the words. It pretty much covers the entire sermon today. It praises God. It exalts God. It's taken from Jeremiah. Uh, you are the potter. We are the clay. So let's sing this song with conviction. Sing it with passion as though it's the first time you've ever sung this song. Amen. What a great or song to end our service with. Make sure you're back next week. Two verses, forgiveness. My favorite preacher after Adam, <laughs> Dave, is going to be sharing the Word of God. I'm excited just to be able to sit and under the preaching of Dave. Dave is preparing for ministry. He's got about one more year of schooling left and then be going into full-time service someplace. We don't know where, but uh, 
I'm excited to have him preach. Ladies, let me encourage you, if you haven't got your tickets to the ladies' tea, you want to do that? Again, the speaker, Julia DeBerry, that's our daughter-in-law, and uh, she's going to come and she's going to share about turning your gardens into gr- or graves into gardens because, you know, our grandson lost all his limbs this past year and what that's been for them as a family. So if you haven't got your tickets, Virginia is upstairs today, uh, but Sabrina is at the table there, so get your tickets. Thank you for being here. Turn to the person next to you and tell them how good they look today. <laughs> 